Today we're going to be talking about how to determine whether or not a sequence is bounded. And in this particular video, we're going to be dealing with two separate problems. The first one is the sequence a sub n is equal to n times the quantity negative 1 raised to the n power. Now, when it comes to determining whether or not a sequence is bounded, the first thing that we need to determine before we can determine whether it's bounded is whether or not the sequence is monotonic, and more specifically, whether or not over time the sequence is always increasing or always decreasing. Remember that if a sequence is over time generally increasing or if over time it's generally decreasing, then we also say that it's monotonic. If it never over time can be called increasing or decreasing, then the sequence is not monotonic. So how do we determine whether or not the sequence is increasing or decreasing? Well, the easiest way to start tackling this question is to plug in values for n, starting with the value n equals 1. So if we tackle this first problem here, a sub n equals n times the quantity negative 1 raised to the n power, if we plug in n equals 1 first, what we'll get is 1 here for n, so 1 times negative 1 raised to the first power, and that's going to give us, of course, negative 1 to the 1 is negative 1 times 1 is negative 1. So that's our value. If we plug in n equals 2, we'll get 2 times negative 1 squared. Negative 1 squared will give us positive 1 times 2 will give us 2. If we plug in n equals 3, we'll get 3 times negative 1 to the third, and when we do that arithmetic, we see that we get negative 3. Now if we keep going, what we'll get here is 4, negative 5, 6, and you should start to see a pattern here. We start with this odd value of negative 1. All of our odd values are negative. Interspersed in between those negative values are positive even values, 2, 4, and 6, all positive numbers. So if we graph this on an xy coordinate plane, right, and we can do this quickly, we don't have to be extremely accurate about it, but if we graph this at n equals 1 here, we get a value of negative 1. At n equals 2, we get a value of positive 2, maybe that's here. At n equals 3, we get a value of negative 3, like this. And if we graphed this, what we would see if we connected these dots is something like this, where we would get up to here and then down way below here, and it would keep going. And basically, if we look at the highest values that the sequence attains, we can see that the highest value will keep increasing, right? We can we can connect these dots like this. The largest value the sequence attains will continue to increase as we take larger and larger values of n. Similarly, the smallest values, the, the lowest values that the sequence obtains, will continue to get less and less, more and more negative as we take larger and larger values of n. So what we can say here, and, and the farther out we go, the more extreme these values get. So what we can say, is that the sequence is never going to either increase or decrease. It's going to keep oscillating back and forth between these positive and negative values. As a result, because over time it doesn't go in one direction, we call this sequence not monotonic. And because it's not monotonic, we can't say that the sequence is bounded. And the reason for that is because the largest value continues to get larger, the smallest value continues to get smaller. There's no upper limit over above which we say that the, the sequence will never obtain some value. There's no upper limit, nor is there any lower limit below which the sequence will never go. It's just going to keep getting larger on the positive end and smaller on the negative end. So it's not monotonic and the sequence is not bounded. Now, if we look at a second example, a sub n is equal to 2n minus 3 divided by 3n plus 4, we want to do the same thing. We want to figure out whether or not the sequence is increasing or decreasing, and therefore whether or not it is monotonic. The easiest way to do that, again, is to just plug in values for n starting with n equals 1. So we'll say n equals 1, we plug that in, we get 2 times 1 is 2, minus 3 is a negative 1, so we get negative 1. And then we plug in 1 in the denominator. 3 times 1 is 3, plus 4 is 7. We get negative 1 7th. If we plug in n equals 2, in our numerator we'll get 2 times 2, which is 4, minus 3 is 1. In our denominator we'll get 2 times 3, which is 6. Add 4 to that and we get 
10, so we get positive 1 tenth. If we plug in n equals 3, in our numerator we'll get 6 minus 3 is 3, in our denominator we'll get 9 plus 4, which is 13. And if we keep going, what we see, and let's go ahead and list these out here, we'll list these out in a sequence format like this, we get positive 1 tenth, we get 3 over 13, and if we keep going, we'll get 5 over 16, and then we'll get 7 over 19, and you guys can check these if you want to, 9 over 22, etc. What we see is that the denominator always increases by a value of 3. 7 plus 3 is 10, plus 3 is 13, plus 3 is 16, etc. It always increases by 3. The numerator increases by 2. Negative 1 plus 2 is 1, plus 2 is 3, plus 2 is 5. It increases by 2. If we take decimal approximations of these fractions here, right, 1 tenth is equal to 0 0.1, 3 over 13 is equal to approximately 0.23, 5 over 16 is equal to approximately 0.31. We can continue doing this. What we see is that the sequence is increasing. 0.23 is greater than 0.1. 0.31 is greater than 0.23, that's always going to be the case. As far out as we go, this value here is going to be greater than the previous value of the sequence. What that tells us is that the sequence is increasing, and because we've said that over time the sequence will always increase, we can also say that the sequence is monotonic. So now that we've said that it's monotonic, we have the chance to determine whether or not the sequence is bounded. Now when we're talking about whether or not a sequence is bounded, we need to look at two things, whether or not the sequence is bounded above and whether or not the sequence is bounded below. If it's bounded above and below, then we can say that in general the sequence is bounded. If it's bounded above but not below, or below but not above, then we have to specify in our, in our final answer, we have to say the sequence is bounded above or the sequence is bounded below so that we know exactly on which end the sequence is bounded. Now because the sequence is always increasing, we know right away that this value here of negative 1 7th will be the lowest or the smallest value that the sequence ever obtains, right? Because the sequence is always increasing, so each value of the sequence is going to be greater than the one before it. That means that our very first value of the sequence is going to be the smallest value. There's never going to be a value of this sequence that's smaller than negative 1 7th. So we know right away that the sequence is bounded below. We're looking at the smallest value here that the sequence obtains. We say it's bounded below. In other words, it can't go below this value. Sequence bounded below and a sub n is always greater than or equal to negative 1 7th, right? It's always going to be greater than this value because the sequence increases. That's easy to tell because we know that the sequence is increasing. But because the sequence is always increasing, does it increase to infinity and always get larger and larger? Or does it approach some limit above which it never goes? That's what we have left to determine. Well, the way in which we determine that end is by taking the limit of our sequence a sub n as n goes to infinity. So what we do is we say the limit as n goes to infinity of a sub n is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of our sequence here, 2n minus 3 divided by 3n plus 4. Now one way that we can solve this, the easiest way to solve for the infinite limit of a rational function like this, this kind of fraction, is to multiply both the numerator and the denominator by 1 over the highest degree n variable. What I mean by that is here we have n to the first power in the numerator, we have n to the first power in the denominator. That's the highest degree in our, in our fraction here of n. If we had n squared in the denominator and n to the first power in the numerator, n squared would be the largest degree n variable in this rational function. So because n to the first is our largest degree term, we want to multiply both numerator and denominator by 1 over n to the first power. In other words, we want to multiply both the numerator and denominator by 1 over n. So 1 over n divided by 1 over n like this. This doesn't change anything because essentially we're multiplying this fraction by 1. What we get then is the limit as n goes to infinity, 2n times 1 over n just leaves us with 2. 
negative 3 times 1 over n leaves us with negative 3 over n divided by 3n times 1 over n leaves us with 3. 4 times 1 over n leaves us with plus 4 over n. And now we're just left with a really easy problem because we can see that if we plug in some infinite value for n, some very, very large value for n, 3 divided by an extremely large value, any constant divided by an extremely large value, is always going to be 0. So these terms that have this n in the denominator, they're going to go to 0. These are both going to go to 0 and cancel out. And all that we're left with here is just this value 2 thirds. So that pops right out, and the value there is 2 thirds. What that tells us is that this infinite limit, the function a sub n, the sequence, levels off, has this infinite limit of 2 thirds, and because we found that value, we can say that the sequence is also bounded above by this value 2 thirds, and we say a sub n will always be less than 2 thirds. Remember that with an infinite limit, the sequence will never actually obtain the value 2 thirds. It'll always be less than 2 thirds as opposed to the sequence being greater than or equal to the value we found here, negative 1 seventh, the first term in the sequence. So because the sequence is both bounded above and below, we can say that in general, the sequence is bounded. If we had found that it was bounded below but not above, then we would have to specifically say it's bounded below. Now one quick thing to note, I just want to point out the opposite scenario. In this particular problem we dealt with an increasing sequence. If we had determined that our sequence was decreasing, then the first term in our sequence would no longer be the lowest value the sequence ever obtains. It would be the largest value the sequence ever obtains. And instead of using this negative 1 7th value for bounded below, we would be bounded above at a sub n is always greater than or equal to this negative 1 7th. So if this is not increasing, it's decreasing instead, then we use this first term for bounded above, and then we have to take the infinite limit to see if the sequence is also bounded below. So we just, we just switch those values if you find that the sequence is, is decreasing instead of increasing.